Trump ally Roger Stone is in the headlines again, all thanks to a group of Danish filmmakers who were following him in the lead up to the January 6th insurrection and shortly after. The documentary crew has handed over video evidence to the January 6th committee. According to the New York Times, part of that evidence shows texts from Roger Stone to a Donald Trump impeachment lawyer seeking a pardon. One of the texts from Stone reads, quote, there will be mass prosecutions Mark my words. Now, this is Roger Stone we're talking about, a convicted liar, so who knows what he actually meant, but I have to say I find it remarkable that even Roger Stone seemed to believe that the Biden DOJ and Attorney General Merrick Garland would go after January the 6th plotters and after people close to Trump. But almost two years later, no one in Trump's inner circle has even been indicted, let alone successfully prosecuted, for any actions relating to January the 6th. Yes, we've had prosecutions of the rioters, but not their alleged handlers or inciters. We were supposed to see some of the video evidence from the Danish documentary featuring Stone in a new January the 6th public hearing this week, but that's now been postponed due to Hurricane Ian. It's worth reminding ourselves, though, just who is Roger Stone? He's a longtime Republican operative, famous for his foul mouth and bigoted rhetoric, who's worked for Nixon and Reagan and George W. Bush all the way to Donald Trump. In 2019, he was convicted for witness tampering and lying to Congress in the Russia election interference probe. Trump pardoned him shortly before leaving office. I guess one pardon wasn't enough for him. Crucially, for the 1-6 committee, the filmmaker who followed Stone claims that he had, quote, very close relationships with leaders of the far-right group, the Proud Boys. In this clip, one of four obtained by NBC News, Stone describes how the Trump campaign planned to sow chaos and exploit the uncertainty of the election results. What they're assuming is that the election will be normal. The election will not be normal. Oh, these are the California results? Sorry, we're not accepting them. We're challenging them in court. If the electors show up at the, at the Electoral College, armed guards will throw them out. I'm the president. F you. You're not stealing Florida. You're not stealing Ohio. I'm challenging all of it. And the judges we're going to are judges I appointed. If they want to run a bunch of fake ballots, we'll have an investigation. We'll say, these ballots are fake. Yep. Your results are invalidated. Goodbye. That's the way it's going to have to work. NBC News reached out to Stone about the clips. He said in part, these are incendiary clips, all of which are covered by the First Amendment. He also said the committee's previous testimony provided against me is categorically false. If any of the members wish to waive their congressional immunity, I'd be happy to sue them. Right, says the man who was convicted of lying to Congress. As we're learning more about Stone's role on January the 6th, can we be sure that this next committee hearing will be the last one? Has the 1-6 committee really exhausted all avenues of inquiry into the insurrection? Remember Ginny Thomas, the wife of the sitting Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas? Are we going to learn more about her texts to Trump's White House Chief of to Trump's White House Chief of Staff, Mark Meadows, advocating for an overturning of the election result and even sending the Bidens to Guantanamo Bay? A new book by former Republican congressman and 1-6 committee staffer Denver Riggleman shows Thomas also pushed QAnon conspiracy theories to Meadows. Riggleman spoke to 60 Minutes about the text on Sunday. What did you think of those Ginny Thomas texts? Actually, as far as academically, it was hell hellaciously insightful. Insightful in what way? Insightful about how the conspiracy theories and sort of this, this digital virus had um, really metastasized uh, in the GOP. You make it sound like an infection. It is an infection. But Ginny Thomas specifically, uh, to see somebody like that who has that type of access to the president and married to a Supreme Court justice, pushing that type of nonsense to the chief of staff, to the president, that's a, that should be an eye-opener for everybody. It's terrifying to consider that the wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice, a prominent conservative activist in her own right, seems to have been sucked in by conspiracy theories to the point where she's in D.C. on January the 6th, on the day of a violent insurrection. And yet, if she's not held accountable for her alleged actions, if Roger Stone isn't, and other Trump acolytes, if they all get away with everything, what's to stop them from doing it all again come January 2025? Joining me now is Hugo Lowell. He's the U.S. congressional reporter for The Guardian. Hugo, thanks for coming back on the show. I want to ask you, how confident are you that this next hearing, whenever it happens, will be the last public hearing from the January 6th committee? 
So it's always fluid with this committee. Um, they may schedule more, they may not. I mean, I'm told that the, the next hearing, the one that was supposed to be happening today, is expected to be the last investigative hearing. They may have more hearings, at least uh, after the midterms, that coincide around the time of the issuance of their final report. It's not clear if we're going to get an interim report anymore, but we will be getting a final report at some point that lays out all of the findings from the select committee's work, as well as recommendations uh, to prevent another January 6th from happening in the future. And so I think we should expect another hearing around kind of the recommendations and the final conclusions of the, of the investigation. Hugo, talk to us about what the committee has planned for this next supposedly last hearing. We'll hear about Roger Stone, I know. But what about Ginny Thomas's role in all of this? She's negotiating an interview with the committee. Are we going to learn more about her role? Might we see clips from her now that they've delayed this hearing? It's a good question, and, and it's not clear. Um, look, Ginny Thomas is talking to the committee uh, on a voluntary basis. She's not testifying pursuant to a subpoena, which means everything she tells investigators uh, is not under penalty of perjury, which I think is actually quite significant. And we should you know, always always bear that in mind whenever someone is talking to the select committee or to Congress. And if they're not under penalty of perjury, I think we always have to make sure uh, we're not reading too much into what they're saying as everything uh, that they know. That being said, and you know, the select committee has always been trying to get her testimony. They see her as an important player in the January 6th story. Um, whether or not they play clips of her deposition, I think, remains to be seen. Um, but it does tie in with this overall concept that the committee wanted to show at this next hearing, which is, you know, people like Roger Stone, people like Steve Bannon, and all these Trump operatives, as well as people like Ginny Thomas, were all involved in trying to overturn the election from before the election had even taken place. And that's really significant because it speaks yes. to a potential conspiracy to obstruct that congressional proceeding. It's a very good point that they were talking about this stuff before the election, not just in the run-up to 1-6. What is the latest, Hugo, on a possible criminal referral from the 1-6 committee to the DOJ? Do we think that's still on the table? Because there was reporting that the committee was split between some members who thought it wasn't necessary and others like Liz Cheney, the vice chair, who thought, yeah, actually, we should be thinking about doing that. From what I understand, it, they're still split. And um, part of the, the reasoning is because the select, uh, because the DOJ has already opened, you know, at least three avenues, three lines of uh, investigation with respect to January 6th. There's that grand jury investigation into the fake elector scheme, which is really hotting up. You know, DOJ sent around 30 to 40 subpoenas to people in Trump's inner circle or what's left of it uh, the other week. Um, DOJ also has that criminal investigation into the rally organized on January 6th. And they also have the criminal investigation um, into into the actual January 6th violence itself. And so the question is, are they going to tie all of this together and are they going to tie it together in a public way so that the committee knows that DOJ is actually acting on, and on some of the, the criminal evidence they already have? And Hugo, are they going to wrap it up in a public way? But are they going to wrap it up when? I mean, are they going to wrap it up? They're talking about end of the year, Jamie Raskin has suggested. For me, I don't understand why they don't just do it before. If they're going to wrap things up and say final hearing. Just do it before the midterms. Why not give the American people a chance to see the report before they go to vote? Instead, we're being told end of the year, right? Yeah, and that's, and that's a really interesting point. The final report's expected to come towards the end of the year. But if you think about the timing now, between now and the midterms, they have to reschedule this hearing some point before, well, probably in the next few weeks before the midterms, right? So when are they going to hold it? Are they going to hold it next week? Possibly. But they could also push it back later into October. So it's really close to the election. And if they do it, then I think we could probably expect a more full-throated hearing where they get into what kind of what Republicans were doing before and after January 6th and the fact that they still pose a threat to democracy today. And I think that's actually quite a compelling message ahead of the midterms.